we all know that hope is a powerful thing. Hope is a very powerful thing. We all have hopes for something. We've all experienced hope, hopefully, at some point in our lives. <clears throat> now, when you're, when I was younger, my hopes were a, a little more trivial. You know, when you're, a, when I was a boy, hopes tended to revolve around football teams and success and that kind of thing. Or um, when you see those snowflakes outside and thinking school might get cancelled, you know, that that kind of hope, which is a bit more trivial, a bit less serious. Uh, but I feel the older you get, depending on your life and your situation, but I often think of the, the older you get, the hopes begin to get more serious or more important. You know, I, I hope that I pass those exams. You have to work, not just hope, I suppose. But, you know, you hope that you get that. You hope you get accepted to a uni or a college or a job um, or that person that you're hoping might want to go out with you won't reject you flat out straight away. They might be show some similar interest. I hope I'm able to get these things. Uh, and even more seriously, maybe I, I hope that I can recover from this illness. I hope I can um, continue. Hope's a powerful thing. Hope drives us. It keeps us going, sustains us. And we know the danger of the opposite of that, don't we? That sense of hopelessness that hits us sometimes. And for some people that goes so far where they just want to give up on life itself. There's no hope for me. Darkness only. And hope constantly crops up in the Bible. And so does hopelessness, actually, when you, when you read it through. You see, even God's people in times of darkness and hopelessness. I was reading the other day, it's surprising the number of, number of prophets or preachers. that are, There's not loads of them, but there's certainly a few that ask God to basically just kill them, you know, which isn't really a sign of hopeful faith, is it? You know, they just say, I'm done, Lord, Elijah, Jonah, right, that's it, I'm out. I've had enough. I, I, I want to be finished. Uh, but hopelessness is just as powerful in the sense that it's dangerous and, and it can have a huge effect on us. But hope is throughout the Bible, and we see hope in the scriptures, we see hope in Jesus Christ. You know, some of the hope I was talking about there, it's kind of like hoping my team's going to win. There's no guarantee, especially when you're Scottish, that your team is going to win. But the hope you see in the Bible is more of a certainty, more of a knowledge, more of an assurance that this God is good and he keeps his word. And so I, what he has said he's going to do, he's going to do it. That, that's the kind of hope that we have as believers and Paul's writing to a church here that, um, I don't know if you remember, as far back as New Year's Day, obviously for those of you that weren't here, it was irrelevant, but we looked at uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 to 12, and we were thinking about how as a church and as individual Christians, we want to be um, living lives that are pleasing to the Lord. That, like, our goal for the new year, as with every year, of course, uh, chapter 4, verse 1 says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you <clears throat> ought to walk and to please God just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. <clears throat> and this was a church that were loved the Lord, loved one another, walked in his ways. Uh, we're a great church, really. If you went through their doors on a Sunday morning, so to speak, you'd, be, you'd, you'd find a loving, faithful, godly group of Christians. But they were a bit confused about one issue in particular at this point. That seems to be what Paul and the others are concerned about. Something was troubling, troubling them and robbing them of some of their hope. And some of their joy. This verse here in verse 13 of that same chapter says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. See, there's a connection there between their lack of knowledge and their hope. Because they didn't understand the situation, their hope had been taken from them. Paul's saying, We don't want you to be uninformed. He's not patronizing them and trying to accuse them of being thick. They just don't know about this particular situation what's going on and it seems these people have lost possibly lost some of their fellowship in the church as in brothers and sisters have died they've um they've gone to be with the lord but they're a little uncertain as to about maybe what's happened to them or what their future is in terms of when jesus is going to ba come back so there seems to be some confusion and some uncertainty surrounding that but paul wants to reassure them of their hope and encourage them and the hope of those who are no longer with them, that have trusted in Jesus. He says uh, that you may not grieve as others do. Um, I think in a lot of cultures, societies, death is a certainly quite often a taboo subject. I think in, for these people around here, it was a very grim subject indeed. People don't want to talk about it too much. He says that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. You see, grief's not wrong. Grief's not bad. It's it's better to do to grieve even Jesus. Grieved and wept and, and those things. Uh, to pretend all is well does, 
doesn't really do anyone much good at all. But the grief of a Christian is different because we can grieve as those who have hope. Even in the tears, the sadness, the depression, whatever it is, we have hope in the midst of that. And we have hope for our brothers and sisters who are no longer with us. Because we can know where they are. See, the resurrection of Jesus Easter Sunday, if it brings one thing to us today, it's hope. Real, solid hope. Not just for tomorrow, for the rest of our lives, though it does, but into eternity itself. And I know I might be hitting on some some difficult things here, because I know for our wee church there's been grief in recent years. There's been pain, there's been tears, and there's been sadness, there's been serious loss. Uh, But I want all of us here, whoever we are this morning, uh, to not be uninformed, not be lacking in knowledge of this great truth and encouragement and hope that we have in Christ, that we might have hope uh, because Jesus has died, he has risen. And he is alive and he is reigning. And so in trusting in him, we can have hope forever. Hope of eternal life with him. Knowledge of that. So he wants them to understand what's going to happen in the future. And what the fate of these other believers will be. First of all, he talks about what did happen. Verse 14, see what did happen. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, Even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. But he he makes that great statement that Jesus died and rose again. Simple statement, but packed with rich, encouraging truth. And there's a question here, because he says, for since we believe, you know, and there's a question maybe for you today, do I believe this? Do I believe that this Jesus that we're talking about, that we're singing about, that we're praying to, that who we're talking about here did he really die did he rise have you believed in that today that he died and why he died what why did this one have to die this perfect one well he died for us he died for our sins to take to pay the penalty to pay the price for our wrongdoing how has he done this how has god made it possible to be reconciled to us through this man through his son The divine one, the perfect one, who lived that perfect life for us, but despite that died that sinner, sinner's humiliating death on the cross for us, bearing the wrath of God. In love, God sent him, and he stepped forward so that he would bear the wrath and that we would be saved. He died so that we might live. He faced it down so that he might give us hope. He died, but that was not the end. He rose from death, defeated our sins, death itself, the powers of darkness, and now he's ascended, he's seated on high, and he's reigning, he's enthroned. Do you believe this? Have you personally, individually believed in this Jesus? Have you trusted in him for your salvation, to know him, to be made right with God, to be reconciled to him? Have you believed in this Jesus? That's what happened, but Paul doesn't stop there. He doesn't just know what's happened in the past. He knows what's coming, which was was a rare thing indeed. I don't know what's coming tomorrow, but Paul had been given information from the Lord. He was understood what was ahead for uh, these people and for the people that had gone to be with the Lord already. He says that even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. It's a polite way of saying somebody's died, you know, somebody's passed away, that kind of thing. Not just that they've dozed off, it's that they've, uh, they've, they've died. They're no longer with the people here, they've died. But he gives them, even in that statement, he gives them some assurance about where they are, where these people are. He will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, suggesting they're already with Jesus. They're already in the presence of their Savior. That's a wonderful comfort, a wonderful truth to know, both for us as we anticipate death, because we know it's coming at some point. The old death and taxes thing, isn't it? It's, you know, we know it's coming. We can't avoid it. It's going to hit us at some point. But if we have Jesus, that's where we go. And for those who have gone already, we are comforted knowing where they are. Those that have died in the Lord. Paul talks about that in a couple of other places, doesn't he? He speaks in a way that we don't really think about a lot or we're not used to hearing. Sort of, he, you know, when he writes to the Philippians, he's an older guy at this point, I think, but he says something like, for... Uh, I would rather depart and be with the Lord for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. 
You often hear that in society and what people say, to die is a win, that's a gain. And the only reason he knew that was because he knew where he was going. So I'd rather depart and be with him. To be in another place, he says uh, in Second Corinthians, which he went through as a church, of course, he's talking about how battered they are as apostles all the time. They get kicked around, persecuted, rejected so much. And they, he feels the weight of that over the years of his ministry. And he says, you know, in truth, we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. He understands where his true home is. It's not here. It's, it's counterintuitive to the way we think. A, he has a certainty about it. He says to be away from here is to be at home with Jesus. And that's, uh, that's fine by me. It's not that he goes looking for it. That's not the point. But the point is when it comes to him, he knows where he's going to be. He's going to be with Christ. And it seems that some people think, some of the people here thought that they weren't sure what would happen with these believers in terms of the return of Jesus, like they might miss out on something, these ones that had died, or they weren't sure what was going to happen. And Jesus says, no, no, no. He says, don't worry about that. We're bringing them with us. They're coming to the, they're coming to the party when Jesus returns. He says, um, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive who are left until the coming of the Lord. So whoever that is, whenever Jesus comes back, whether that's us or whether that's somebody else, whether, you know, whatever generation that happens in, uh, we will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So they were worried about the fate of these believers. And he said, no, 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 they're, they're, they're going to be there. They're going to be fine. He says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel. Not that he's an archangel, but the voice of, of an archangel with the sound of the trumpet of God. You often see this kind of thing in the Old Testament, trumpets announcing the coming of the Lord. Royalty, kingship, battle even. The Lord is here. Be, be ready. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So they will rise with the Lord and they'll come and then meet those who are on the earth waiting. It's an amazing thought. It's hard to even picture it and imagine it now, isn't it? Like looking ahead at the Lord's return and how he's going to come. He's going to bring all these people with him. One of the common imageries we see here, it says that we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, this is more exciting than it sounds, you know, living in the northeast of Scotland. We, we get enough of clouds. We, we have enough of those, thank you very much. We look out the window and clouds do not bring hope, you know, resurrection, joy, do they? You're thinking, oh, it's probably going to rain, isn't it? But it's more of a, an exciting thing than that because throughout the Old Testament, you see this, and throughout the Bible, the sense of cloud is, represents God's presence. You know, it's hard to know how much of this you sort of see as literal, figurative, whatever, but the cloud, uh, the idea of thinking of Mount Sinai and the cloud descended on the top and you knew the presence of God was there and Moses went up to the presence of God. Or even when they're in the, the wilderness and they're going through the wilderness, they're led by a cloud by the day, a pillar of fire by night. Or when a Daniel sees the Son of Man, he's given that vision and he's coming on the clouds. This represents divine presence, God's presence, that he is on his way. This is how, what, I think this is what we're to understand here. It says we will be caught up together with them in the clouds. He says if you're wondering where those people are going to be, Here's where they're going to be. They're going to be here. They're going to be with Jesus and you're going to meet them there. It's kind of caught up idea. Some people think of, this might be speaking of back in, uh, back in the day, back in their day. Uh, if a royal dignitary, somebody you would roll out the red carpet for in our day was coming to town, uh, people would go out to meet this dignitary and escort them back into the, into the city, onto the throne or wherever they might be. And some people wonder if there's a sense here we'll be caught up with Jesus as he comes back to reign and he will come and reign and dwell on the earth with his people because that's what we see at the end is it not that when jesus returns he will the new heavens and the new earth come together his new redeemed creation and we reign and we rule with him under under him as he reigns and rules over all things what an image what a day we're looking forward to it's not yet we don't know when it's going to be but it's going to be well exciting when it happens it's going to be glorious when he returns it, it was, he told the apostles um, when Jesus was risen again and uh, he, he gave them the commission, he spoke to them and then he ascended. You know, there's that kind of um, thing that for us as Christians who are familiar with the Bible, and we've heard it a lot, actually seems quite normal. But somebody coming to the Bible and reading it finds it a bit strange. I have seen that here where Jesus kind of ascends and it says a cloud hid them from their sight. <laughs> but, but the disciples would have understood because he's going to the presence of God. 
in the cloud. But he says he will return in the same way that you saw him come. Because the disciples were standing there as you would, look, or we would, looking up into the sky, just astonished. And the angel comes and says, um, why are you staring at the sky? It's going to come back in the same way that you saw him go. This is the day we're looking forward to when we will be with him. And those who have trusted in him will dwell with him forever instead of facing eternal separation from him and eternal punishment. We can reign and be present and dwell with him forever. What a great hope. What a picture for these people who had lost hope, who were confused, who were uncertain. It's that reassurance of knowing this is, this is where it's going. And in that, that verse 18 there, she told them what happened with Jesus, what's going to happen with Jesus. And there's often that, Paul's really good at just applying stuff and saying, well, so what then? You know, if, uh, verse 18, he says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. That's a small thing in some ways, but these believers were doubting. They were <coughs> unsure of what was going to happen. They'd lost a bit of their hope. And he said, encourage one another with these words. Remember these things, store them up, teach them to one another, encourage and build one another up. We would do well to do that more with one another when we are doubting, when we're struggling, when we're wrestling, when we've lost our hope, when things, times are dark and difficult and uncertain, to encourage one another with the truth of the gospel of what Jesus has done for us and what he's going to do in the future, and where we're going to be in the future, the hope that we have in him. Encourage one another, build one another up, go out of our way in order to do that, make that our goal with one another. But Paul told them what has happened what is to come? I don't know all the details, but it gives us a great picture of that. It says, encourage one another with these words, with this great hope that we have. So I said at the start, we all know what it is to experience hope. We all know the power of hope. And we saw this, we've seen this as we thought about Easter weekend. You see the the lows and the highs of God's people there, don't you? And on Good Friday and in Saturday, you see the the darkness as they see their Lord crucified and they don't get it yet. They're just looking at, he's just died, that's it. End game, it's all done. That, and that darkness of that weekend. And then the unspeakable joy of the Sunday morning when they realize that he's risen, he's alive. And the hope that that brought to them. I don't know where you are today or how you feel this morning. I don't know, perhaps you are full of hope and joy and excitement and passion even in your faith for the Lord in some way. But you might be here this morning, you feel hopeless and dark. And you can't see any joy, you can't see any goodness. I feel like everything's going wrong in your life. You've lost hope, you've lost perspective. If you are a Christian, then you have great hope in him today. And I don't say that as a trite thing to just kind of magically sort of wash away everyone's problems but just the sense that in the midst of all that despite all of the that might be going on around there is this great hope in Christ I think that that can get me through the next day I can get me through the next day because I have this hope in him today might be hard but the future is bright for believers because you have Christ and you will be with him forever I know some here today are grieving maybe grieving still could be a grievance from years ago. Just came up again today in your minds or in your hearts. You grieve and miss maybe those family members uh, that knew the Lord or those brothers and sisters in Christ who they might not be biological family, but they were family. You know, they were, they were proper family anyway. And you miss them. They're gone. They're not here anymore. You miss their encouragement, their presence, their prayers. Our, our previous minister told me that when uh, one of the elders in the church died, he says, I'm telling you, I missed his prayers. I knew he'd gone. I felt it daily because that, I knew that guy prayed for me. Every, he almost had this intense feeling that he was gone. I just, I just missed him. I missed his, missed his prayers. I missed their presence. Well, you can have certainty about those who need the Lord. You can have certainty about those people and about their future. They are with him now and they will be with him forever. And we will be with them, him altogether. And maybe you're a Christian who feels, and I, I'm, Please, I'm not in any way trying to be funny here at all, but you feel you're getting older. Time is going on. You feel a lot closer to heaven than you used to. And maybe there's some fear there even. Perfectly understandable. No, fear not. Because what a hope, what a future. 
you have in, in him a future you have ahead what and what a great message of hope we as believers have to share with other people in a day when people seem hopeless and lost and can, there's a lot of confusion in our culture in our society it could be you and you're not a christian and you've placed your hope in all kinds of other things in the stuff of life in the what you can get your hands on or a particular lifestyle or your work or family and those are all good things, often very good things, good gifts from God. The problem is we just put them in the place of God so often and we make those the things we pursue and those the things that ultimately we worship. It can be the danger. Because those things can be taken from us. And when they go, what do we do if we've placed all our hope in that? But if we have Christ, he can never be taken away. Our eternal security can never be taken away. And so if we hope in him and what he has, even through the darkest most difficult of times. He is with us and he will sustain us and see us through to glory. We put our hope in people. As we say, people pass away. People can betray us. People can hurt us. We hurt other people. Because we're sinners. And others get it wrong too. Put your hope in Jesus today, the one who loves you, who died for you, who rose again, and because of that, through faith in him, through him, we can have life forever with him. You need not face the penalty for your sins. You need not face what you deserve because Jesus already has. We're back in the courtroom today. We don't, for those of us who are visiting, we don't normally come to church in court. But over COVID, because of the social distancing, we use this room. But so often I'd be standing preaching the gospel about how we stand as guilty sinners before God and... <laughs> The imagery was very rich, you know, when you're standing here and you think, gosh, it's a, it puts it in perspective. We stand as the guilty party. And yet one who is not guilty, who is entirely innocent and pure, spotless, he stepped forward and took the punishment for our crime. The judge would have been right uh, to punish us, to give us what we deserve. But there is one who so loved us that he gave himself for us to save us from our sins and what we deserve. And because of that, if our hope is in him, we will dwell with him forever in the place where there will be no more weeping, no more pain, no more sickness, no more suffering. It will all be gone. We will dwell with him when he returns. We'll be caught up with him and live and reign with him forever. Is your hope and trust in him today and in him alone? Let's pray together.